Uh, hello. Oh, okay. Oh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the 10 a.m. session in the content and community track. As a reminder to our in-world and web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org and tweet your questions or comments at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC14 exclamation mark because it's very exciting. This hour, we are happy to introduce a terrific session called Resmilla, Virtual Training Scenario Authoring to Maximize Return on Investments in Virtual Learning Environments. Our speaker today is Ramesh Sharma Ramlo. Ramesh has been developing immersive virtual learning environments for diverse user groups during the past seven years on platforms that include Second Life and OpenSim. He is currently the CEO, CTO of Deep Semaphore LLC, and, which is an e-learning and simulation solutions company. Welcome all, and let's begin the session. Thanks uh, very much, Alexis. Um, yeah, um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, um, our uh, about Resmilla, which is a, uh, a product that I've been working on for the past one and a half years. And uh, I'll describe uh, my approach of, of trying to increase um, return on investment in um, virtual learning environments. Um, the reason why I was interested in this is because uh, whenever when clients would come and, um, and, and meet me, um, they would always be ready to invest in, you know, in, in creating a virtual learning environment. Um, but they, they also wanted some, some, some guarantees on you know, uh, whether they would be able to modify it to meet their future needs and how it could be done easily. Um, for example. So, um, in order to address um, these situations, these uh, particular concerns for our clients, I was thinking uh, how I would design um, in OpenSIM um, so that I would, I, I would always try to make something that's easily customizable by, by the users of the virtual environment. And that got me thinking about you know more generally about customization, okay? Uh, so how how we actually dissect uh, a hole into usable parts, into reusable parts, and and uh, and how we can actually connect these parts in new in new ways, in new configurations to meet other needs. Um, and it turns out that it's not so straightforward. There is no science to it, and uh, and uh, it's kind of an art at this stage. Okay, um, so why, why, how does uh, customization uh, impact return on investment? Um, basically, when you buy something, you want to be able to, to use it, not only for the things that you already uh, thought you would be using it for, but also for, for emerging needs. So you want to be able to reuse, you want to be able to adapt it to new goals, and... Uh, and so that's what I, I, I actually um, started addressing when I when I started working on on Resmela. Um, is this a new goal? No, it's not. It's, there's been uh, other people who have been trying to address this solution. Um, there are some some similarities between uh, our and our approach and others, but I think there is a big chunk of our approach that is that is uh, quite new. Um, so, let me move on to the next slide and, and, and slowly bring you into, you know, the, the, the main gist of the talk. So, if you look at how uh, customization is done in, in other domains, uh, how, how people actually build things, I was looking at, for example, the, the construction set approach that we are all familiar with because as children, we were all exposed to to, to construction sets uh, such as Lego, Meccano, Kenex. Meccano is probably more of a European thing. Maybe it's rebranded in the US. I don't know, you know what, what it's called here. 
But basically, you've got parts that you've got to assemble and, uh, and build things. And uh, what, what got me thinking uh, was uh, how those, those basic parts were created. It seems that there's been, uh, there was a lot of thought that went into you know, designing those, those basic elements. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's not as simple as you would actually you know, imagine uh, at first glance. It seems that, there's been, that there has been a lot of iteration before they settled on, 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 um, on the basic elements. Um, so if you move on to uh, the realm of the virtual, you find that, again, you have the same construction set approach uh, where you want to, to help people as, assemble parts, little things together in order to get, uh, you know, useful stuff. Um, Minecraft is kind of, a, you know, uh, of a Lego type environment you, you, where the, the unit is, is the block and you either subtract block, I mean, that's the mining thing, or you, you can assemble together and, and build stuff. Um, Second light, life, we have the notion of prims. Uh, it's slightly more complicated because you also have uh, the possibility to, 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 to script it. Minecraft also provides uh, facilities for adding behaviors through programming. Uh, but second life is the, the medium I actually got introduced to this kind of things. So I'm more of a, of a second life user. Um, and uh, that's where actually, you know, um, got exposed the first time to this kind of environments. I also came across the Kerbal Space uh, program, which is another software that I find to be quite interesting. Uh, you know, you get to, to put together uh, different components of a, robo of a, of a, um, of a rocket, and, uh, and then you fire it up, etc., and then you see how it behaves. Um, I think um, what, what you see here is that they, there seems to be uh, a way for creating end products very fast, but when you do this, you lose diversity of end products. You know, it's kind of um, when, when you design the subparts, if you can actually make it uh, at, at the atomic level, you, you can actually build a, a vast variety of end products, but if you decide to draw the boundaries somewhere else, you might be able to end up with a smaller set of end products, but then it has advantages such as, you know, you can actually build things quicker. For example, if you were to build uh, maybe the Kerbal Space uh, type of, of rockets, it would probably take more time if you were to repeat the same exercise in Second Life than just go into the, the Kerbal Space program and build it from there. Um, so the, the next slide, um, I'm talk, going to talk a bit about what, about how I got inspired to work on Resmilla. Okay, it's not a digression. It's just um, you know just to tell the story of, of how it happened. I, I, I the the idea started when I came across uh, well, I came across the pantograph since I was a kid, but it it came to my mind when I was designing Resmilla. I mean, at the beginning, why? fairly recently, when I saw uh, that it's possible, uh, you know, with a you know, really simple setup of links and joints, you could actually use this simple setup to magnify what you want to do. By this I mean, uh, for example, if you want to draw a little, cir a big circle, and if the only thing you can do is to draw a little circle, you can use that, the, that contraption to uh, to draw the little circle, but at the same time to magnify it somewhere else. So it's it's like you've got this piece of 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 technology that that extends your your reach in doing things. You know, if you want to make something bigger, uh, you you can actually you know put your pen at the point P in this diagram and make the circle. And then if you have another pen at the point Q, you'll have a bigger circle. And if you want to do the reverse, if you want to do something very Precise and tiny, and you you are not very um, you know um, you know you, maybe you are more um, art articulate doing larger things. You can draw the big circle, and you end up with a more precise smaller circle. Um, just keep this in mind, and then you'll see how this simple idea extends into the basic idea that powers 
uh, Reis Mela. Okay, the, the, the same um, basic mechanism of the pentograph is used in, you know, in, in probably more things than, than you can imagine. It's been used, um, for example, um, you know, in elaborate hoaxes. For example, the Mechanical Turk uh, is one of the most famous hoaxes that uses the pantograph. And here what you have is you have somebody that's hidden inside a, a box and that has access to one tip of the pantograph and it actually drives the hand of this, uh, of this uh, Turk automaton um, who is playing chess with, uh, you know, a, a real human being. There are lots of ideas here that this simple situation has encapsulated. In one sense, you know, the person has the impression that they are dealing with an intelligent automaton when actually there is somebody, uh, you know, un like uh, they are interacting with an intelligent machine when in fact there is some someone inside the box through a pantograph, uh, moving, you know, the, the, the hands of, of, of the mechanical Turk. Um, I'm just trying to segue slowly into the Resmila idea. So here we have the Resmila board. Um, so what that is, um, just imagine uh, you, you, are, you are on a virtual region in OpenSIM, and then you have an in-world map. Uh, and that map is just like a small prim, uh, well, smallish prim. It's just two meters by two meters. And anything you put on that prim will appear um, at the right proportions and at the right positions in the, the larger region. Okay, the larger region in this case is 256 meters by 256 meters. So if you were to put little objects on that inward map, you know, you, you would actually see all these larger scale objects appearing in the larger environment, okay? And you have uh, a fairly big ma magnification even in, in this simple example. And uh, the, the other thing that you can use this mini map for is, um, well, it's a map, you know, it has map functionalities. And, um, and, and the reason why I, I, I started working through this is that in parallel, I was working on developing a, a tabletop exercise uh, for emergency preparedness folks. And what happens is when these people want to, um, to do their tabletop exercise, they would, be, they would have like models of a, of a town, uh, of a road network, and they would be role playing around the table with, you know, little cars, little, you know, assets that they would deploy and then they would speak about the, they would collaboratively discuss about the, the situation and, and, and interact with each other. So there you have the idea of a diorama kind of thing, you know, on, on a table. And here we have the idea of a map that's, that's, that allows you to, to magnify whatever you put on this table. So I said, okay, let's fuse the two. If you fuse those two ideas, you have a map that can function as a diorama for, for people you know, who want to collaborate around a desk. But at the same time, you have a virtual environment that arises in, in uh, you know, the larger space that you can visit you know, as a, you know, and, 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 and use. Um, so let's move on to the next slide, just to give you know more 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 weight to to uh, to what's going on here. So um, the the thing that I wanted to to mention is that with the Resbelam board, it's 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 not just like putting objects on a two D surface and then the object appearing on uh, somewhere on on in the in in the wider region out there appearing on, on that 2D plane. It's, it works in 3D. So if I have a mountain and then I'm putting a tree on top of the mountain, you know, of course the tree is going to appear on top of the mountain in the um, larger um, region, in the, in the wide open, open sim region. So in actual fact, it's, it's a 3D pantograph, really. Anything that you do in this 3D space happens in the outer larger scale. Um, so that's just, uh, you know, to, to stress the 3D functionality. 
The next slide is about um, what happens when we, you really magnify the size of the region. You keep the size of the map the same, of course, but you're actually scaling up. And you'll see um, uh, in the forthcoming slides how I, I actually demonstrate how that as the size increases, as the size of the environment increases, the power of that approach actually increases as well. And you'll see why. Okay, so in this case, we just have a two by two board that people can stand around and put objects on and collaborate on. And at the same time, as they do this, they can see a whole environment emerging on a very large scale. Okay. So this slide was about the scalability of the approach. The next slide shows, um, you know, I remember when I first started doing this, this work, somebody asked me, uh, well, why don't you just drop content from, the, from your viewer, I mean, from your inventory, okay? Uh, <laughs> so I said, okay, let's do an experiment. Okay, so, so we, we used the, the NASA task load index, which allows um, one to measure the subjective workload that somebody would experience when they are actually building something, you know, in, a, in an open sim region. And what we found was that, again, my, my intuition was that, you know, as the area is going to increase, the area of the region in, uh, is going to increase, um, the, the, uh, the, the method we propose would actually, the advantages that our approach propose, uh, uh, brings forth is going to be, become more and more prominent. And, and that turns out to be exactly what we found. Um, basically, um, there is one factor here that we found to be very relevant, and I define it as the travel distance for content deployment. That's, that's the distance that you have to travel when you're taking you know, content from your inventory and you want to place it somewhere you know, in that region. Okay? And then with Resmila, it's, it's you know, selecting uh, the object from the visual, uh, visually uh, well, from the visual browser, select that uh, item and click on the board. Okay, so that's that's basically the the, the two different types. In in the larger region, the, the the travel distance encompasses you know coming around, walking, flying. I'm not here taking into consideration. You know, this is like really uh, an um, um, an underestimate of of, of uh, you know, the difficulties that, that people will experience because, for example, if you are looking at the inventory, there, there are other factors and you have like hundreds of objects in the inventory, it's not easy to know visually which object is, if, if you know, a particular object is really what you need. Whereas in our case, we have a browsable library of objects that you can shuffle through and you can have, you know, a visual, uh, icon that describes the object. Okay, so that's one factor that might have explained why it's easier to build using our approach. But I think the main factor is the travel distance for content deployment. The other thing is the, there are other tasks that's involved. You've got to align objects. You've got to uh, rotate them appropriately, etc. But there's already a lot of intelligence with, uh, with our approach that's built into the system so that when you put, you know, uh, buildings on, on a road network or you put um, objects close together, um, there's enough intelligence in the systems where they will actually align things properly so that things don't appear to be uh, out of place, okay? So in summary, if you look at the graph here, um, if you look at the content deployment area, which is basically the size of the world, you find that as the size of the world increases, the temporal demand on people actually creating content with resume lights almost a plateau because they're only dealing with a small fixed area. Whereas, you know, if you're building um, for a very large environment, you know, it's, it's going to increase linearly because you have to travel more and you've got to use your camera and uh, you also lose, uh, you know, the overview because while working in the details, you might actually lose, you know, an overview of what you're doing. And uh, let's move on to the next slide. 
So this is an example uh, of, uh, you know, I'm just using a board to, to deploy like um, some content on a mega region, which is, uh, I think this one was 512 by 512. Um, and now with var region, it's going to be more fun as well, you know, and uh, I will keep on trying with much larger and larger regions. But here what I've done is I've just placed a road network and I've started planting trees around and, and, and throwing some mountains, uh, some vehicles and buildings, um, just to show, uh, you know, just to demonstrate, just by interacting with this board here, you can just see the whole environment just unfolding uh, in real time. Uh, so this took me about uh, seven, eight minutes just to deploy and then you save the whole environment as a file that you can you know, load uh, any other time you want. Okay, next slide. Yes, that's half of the story though. Um, the, the, the thing, you know, as we progressed, that's, I think that's going to uh, really, you know, put us in a different category as far as, as, object, as virtual environments cre creation is concerned. Um, the previous approach uh, where you have a board where you put things and, and 3D content uh, you know, emerges, there are some people who have done it you know, through a website. You go to a website, you have a drawing board, you start dropping things on it, on, on, on that uh, board on the website, and then your environment arises or emerges in, in the virtual. Mm -hmm. The disadvantage with that approach, which is like, you know, you go on a browser and on an image on a 2D surface and do this, is one is that you don't have access to 3D, um, you know, elevation stuff that I've just been describing so that. For example, if you have like you're building um, a, a skyscraper and you want to pick and choose which floor and what type of objects would go into it, uh, then it, it kind of it becomes difficult. Without without with our approach, you can actually choose and layer objects one on top of the other. You can have a tree on top of a mountain, or you can have, you know, basically what I'm saying is like it's 3D. The other advantage is that our interface is in-world and therefore directly accessible to, uh, to an HMD display, to a head-mounted display, and you don't need to do anything extra, you know, to allow in-world 3D content deployment. Okay, so here for, for, for the thing that I wanted to talk about is um, our interface not only allows uh, the, the user to, to create content, or to control content. For example, if I have um, an icon on my board that represents a group of people, I can select that icon and move it somewhere else and move the crowd of people to the other location that I want to. So it's kind of a control interface. So that's simple and well explained in my previous examples. The other thing is you have a feedback loop. So whatever happens in the world object about those objects produces a change in the icons. Like there's like, now um, Resmela has evolved into an information visualization application. So you have the, at the same interface, you can control what's happening in the world. And at the same interface, you can see what's happening inside the environment. So if you send your, send your students out or your, your trainees or people working in that environment and changing objects over there, we expect you know, feedback to be fed into the icons so that somebody can have uh, like an intelligent view of events or an in-context view of events happening in, in the, the real world. Okay, so Resmela does not only provide a rapid content deployment approach, it is also a virtual world control and real-time information visualization application. All right, so next slide, I'm going to, sh to, to, to give you just an example. So let's say that on your board here, which is the in-world map, you've got, um, you know, of course, a mountain and a tree and a group of NPC characters and there's like a, a forest, and, uh, and then there is a storm, and you have two views here, okay? Um, what I'm saying by this is that you have two concurrent maps. 
So the way the the, the way this is uh, working is that not only you have one one in-world map, but you have two of them, and you can have multiple of them, and all of them are synced. But you are dividing the the the, the control among many different people. So let us say you have somebody who is dedicated to controlling climate. Okay, so that person in the view on the left would be moving the clouds and the and the lightning, and in the other view, you know, somebody is actually moving the population. So they would be actually moving, you know, the the non-player characters and try to move them far away from the storm. Okay, so here you have concurrent views more than one view, talking to objects in the real world, and then they are synced. So one is changing, you know, one is controlling one aspect of the world and the other one is controlling the other aspect. So this is the control example using multiple concurrent views. Now we come to the reverse situation where you are actually visualizing what's happening, okay? So what, what's happening in... in, in um, the div reverse direction is that um, you can see the clouds and the lightning has reached so, you know, the, the, the population of NPC characters. And in the second view, you can also see that there are two NPC, NPC characters um, who've been victims of, this, of the storm. They've been struck by lightning and those icons are changing in order to represent that. So that's just an example of having two concurrent views, interacting with objects in the 3D world, and then getting feedback through those very same views, okay? Next example. This is the very first embodiment of the ResMiller board when we, I started implementing it. So um, if you look at figure A, that's like a top view of, uh, it's like a rectangle, but it's actually like a square, right? But I just had to fit in the text in, those, in that small space. So you have two different regions. You have one, two different areas of one region. Okay, you have a theory space, which is uh, basically where the board is and where avatars are able to look at, and, you know, they, they sit around the board and, and talk about things happening on the board. And then you have the practice space. That's where the actual environment emerge. All right. So um, in figure B, you can see how the board looks like. Um, and it's got a, a browser of, of the various components that, that is contained in the you know, ResMiller library. OK. So you can actually browse through various categories. I'll, I'll give more examples of that in. Uh, I'm just checking my time here. All right. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, let's move on to, to the next slide because I think um, there's much, not much here. You can see that there's a theory space, a practice space. In the theory space, you have the board. In the practice space, that's where the, the world emerges. Okay. And the students can actually shift from theory to practice and back to theory. And, and discuss, you know, various things with the instructor. All right, next. Um, that's an example list of objects that we, that we, ha we have been using to, uh, to assemble um, uh, various scenarios that was needed in, a, in our specific context. We are planning to increase this library of objects in order, of course, to increase the diversity of our virtual learning environments that can be produced. Okay, um, like I was saying in the beginning, just to tie up what I'm saying with what we I introduced in the very first slides, when you're trying to design these little um, libra these library objects, there's a lot of decisions that comes in. You know, whether you want to have, you know, a, an object that's going to represent a single tree, or whether it's going to represent a forest or a park. How often are those objects going to be used? If, for example, you have a particular object that used very often, then you want to turn that straight away into a library objects, into a library object, so that the person can pick that object, you know, in a single click and just put it wherever they want in the world through the board. Okay. The same thing with buildings. You can have um, objects which are at the level of um, 
of floors or you can have like a, f a full building you can have vehicles different types of vehicles police EMT firefighter helicopter etc different types of equipment uh, different kinds of people and uh, of course you have the weather there are, there are other categories okay uh, that we've that we've been uh, um, that that we've implemented that's not an uh, exhaustive list but just to show that you know how we build the library okay and there's one aspect that I think is new is that all our one one important um, element of our design is uh, what we call the malleable link set um, what that is, it's, it's a group of objects that's linked together that can be directly manipulated by a user, either through touch or clicks, in order to change its shape, function, or behavior. And an M-link set is a dynamic link set. It can grow, it can shrink. You know, you can actually sh uh, just shove off um, subparts or keep adding subparts into the same link set so that it still maintains its integrity as a single object um, that can be, you know, moved about and uh, and uh, modified through the board. An example will make th this clearer. Um, for example, in the in the in the picture A, you can see me standing in front of uh, a number of roadblock items, and then there is a road. So these block items and the road are actually part of the same link set. Okay, and my task here was actually to deploy a set of roadblocks on the road. And I did that by clicking on these um, objects on the side of the road, which are actually acting as menu uh, buttons of a link set. And it, genera it allows me to generate the various, the number of cones I need. And every time a cone is generated, it's linked automatically to the existing link set. So the whole thing remains as one object. So if I want to delete that whole object in one click, one go, boom, everything goes. And if I want to add things to it, you know, um, I can keep on doing that. So it's, it's kind of, you know, that's how you have little functionalities injected into the library of objects themselves. Uh, in figure C, I just wanted to demonstrate, you know, you can have deeper functionalities uh, attached to the library objects themselves. So in this case, I just have, you know, um, clicking the, the two consecutive cones, for example, will allow you to, to, to deploy uh, a tape uh, with, a, with a specific, you know, uh, visual marking that has specific meanings, at least for emergency preparedness folks. So as you can see, you can have really advanced behavior with um, the, the Resmila with objects from the Resmila library. And, and here, um, let me see here, just more examples of linked objects. For example, in figure A, the whole um, table with the card games and everything that's on it, the dice, et cetera, that's one Resmila object. So you have, if I were to design a game room, I would be able to, to, to select one item as a game element and just drop it into the environment and have, you know, the, the whole uh, game environment deployed with everything working because each and every one is independent, but they're all linked, although they don't appear to be. You know, even the cards that are produced in real time and, and that are removed extra, it's really like a link set that's growing and shrinking. And I want to thank Chris here for making some changes in the open sim core code where I didn't have to ask permission you know, for, for adding uh, an object and linking, linking it automatically. So you have forced link commands, for example, that you can use. Uh, example B shows a simulation of Minecraft, at least just at the you know, construction level. Um, you know, same idea, that's a linked object, creating those little cubes and, and, and adding them up. You can have a classroom, which is, you know, a Resmila object. You can have a, f uh, like, figure D shows, like a fully furnished uh, um, hospital room environment. And you have a house and, 
and it's uh, and F is uh, basically you can use the same approach to build um, applications as uh, Resmilla objects. You know, in this case, that particular application allows you to build molecules and you know in your class. Just examples. Okay. Next, uh, we have vehicles, and again, you have the same principle. I mean, as an object that can be driven, um, you can carry non-player characters. You know, like this bus is full of non-player characters that you're driving around. We are using ODE on Kitely. We had about five, six of these vehicles running at the same time without any delays, um, which is quite impressive when I'm open sim environment. And see, we ju that's just a snapshot of a of of a war scenario. I just deployed some assets on on the board, and. Uh, you know, and, uh, and and you can have you know uh, this, this this environment. All right. So I was thinking when you, if you were to put all these things together, okay, uh, this reminds me of the Wizard of Oz movie. Uh, it seems that okay, the instructor could be like the Wizard of Oz behind the board, the Resmila board, and control everything that's happening in that world. Okay. Um, you can have one board, you can have multiple board, multiple teachers, all kinds of collaborations happening, dividing and conquering the teaching tasks and creating a very interesting environment for the students. You can evolve the teaching paradigm so that you now have um, the teacher play with the students. You know, they would not be opponents, but they can actually create challenges for each other. So you have a situation where the teacher now we, plays with the students and the students are in the real, in the virtual world, you know, on the other end, on the other side of the of the curtain, as it were, and and doing this stuff, why the teachers, you know, create challenges for them. Okay, next slide. Um, well, um, the the Wizard of Oz experiment uh, is actually um, a well known, um, you know, terminology in in uh, in computer science, and. Uh, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's an experiment where subjects interact with a uh, computer system that subjects believe to be autonomous, but which is actually being operated or partially operated by an unseen human being. And this slide ties up with what I introduced earlier with the mechanical Turk. There was a person inside the, 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 you know, the box that was controlling the automaton, you remember, that's a very old idea. Of course, we have, you know, the Turing tests and things like that that came afterwards, but you can see those are really old ideas. And uh, this is the expected evolution of the Resmila board operating intervention. What I mean by this is that as we evolve, we are going to add more and more autonomous behaviors in the Resmila objects. Right now, for example, the teacher will have to do a lot of tasks. If, for example, there is a fire that started in a forest, the teacher might be involved in adding, you know, the source of the fires and control how it, it's, the, the fire is actually spreading in the forest. But you could um, imagine adding intelligence into the, the, the forest and the fire so that, you know, it becomes an autonomous process. So you can see that a lot of things that are mediated through the teacher, through the instructor, through the person behind the board can be pushed and outside uh, his or her control and automated, you know, in the environment so that they have less things to do, um, but more time to create advanced, more advanced scenarios. Okay, so that's the graph, okay? The percentage of situations that require board operator interventions, that's the yellow line, that's going to decrease over time, and the percentage of world objects with pre-programmed autonomous responses, that's going to increase over time. All right? So, so that's, um, um, you know, uh, in terms of how uh, things will, uh, will, will evolve in terms of, you know, the, the separation of, of uh, powers between the operator and what's actually happening in the environment. Right, the summary and conclusion, how does Resmila directed <laughs> directly increase return on investment in virtual learning environments? First, we want to maximize reuse of subparts as much as possible. We want to make it easy for people to assemble them. 
Um, the process is real time and it's really uh, user driven. Uh, we are we are really trying to to evolve into a zero scripting, customizable environment. Okay, it's kind of contrary, but I think it's possible. Um, Resmela enables uh, you know the high assembly of virtual learning environments through point and click. Okay, basically we are, I'm a big fan of direct manipulation. I want to hold things, click things, drag, stretch things. Okay, I'm not too much a fan of you know, sitting and typing in code. All right, so the nature of the core Resmail interface is such that it makes it immediately available in a fully immersive 3D setting through 3D headsets. I, I, I said that before. But, uh, okay, and lastly, Resmail reduces the gap between theory, theory instruction and the practicing of learned concepts. So we really have you know, squeeze the, the gap between theory and practice because you can navigate from the theory to the practice space very rapidly. The, the reason I, why I call this the theory space where you have the board, because if you look at my design originally, I mean, if you have a chance to visit, uh, visit us and, and I can show you the demo, we also have the other tools like the slideshows, et cetera, that happens on the board itself, okay? Um, so I think I've, I'm just, I've just finished exactly on time. Um, so let me hear your questions. Okay, well, thank you, Ramesh, for a terrific presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Following this session at 11 a.m., we have a break in the schedule for lunch or dinner, wherever you may be in the physical world. We also encourage you to visit the Story Wheel exhibit in the Education 2 region to view a tool created in the 16th century called the Books Wheel, which can be thought of as a precursor of the modern website. In addition, if you are a crowdfunder at the exclusive access level or above, you are invited to a VIP Q&A session with today's keynote speakers in the Staff Zone Auditorium at 11 a.m. Finally, we'll return after the lunch break in the keynote regions for an exciting keynote address from Philip Rosedale of High Fidelity, who will attempt to answer the question, what is...